Uh, so um, what I wanted to sort of say, following the great insights from the panel this morning, is that there are different approaches to greenhouse gas removal, um, and they have different characteristics. And one of those characteristics is actually the basically uh, the technology readiness level that they already have and the rate at which they can be scaled. And we have to factor in all of these features when mapping out the future for greenhouse gas removals as we sort of navigate a pathway to one and a half degree centigrade, which is where we should be still striving for. press conference on new greenhouse gas removal pathways. This presentation is a collaboration between the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge University and the Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Charles Gregoire, and I'm co-producer along with Heidi Bro of the Climate Emergency Forum, and I will be today's host. We will discuss how new greenhouse gas removal approaches can play an important role in tackling climate change. I'd like to introduce each of our panelists, and I will ask them each to raise their arm as I announce them as follows. Dr. Sean D. Fitzgerald is the Executive Director of the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge University. Sean is Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, who works at the interface of academic research business, government policy, and public engagement. He has worked extensively in the commercialization of new intellectual property arising from university research and supported the UK government in the rewriting of policy documents for building standards. Next is Dr. Chelsea Baker. And Dr. Chelsea Baker is an ocean biochemical data and model analyst at the National Oceanography Centre in the UK. Her research focuses on the biological carbon pump and the controls on particle flux and subsequent carbon storage in the ocean. Next is Paul Holthus. Paul Holthus is founding president and chief executive officer of the World Ocean Council. He works with the private sector and market forces to develop practical solutions for achieving sustainable development and addressing environmental concerns, especially for marine areas and resources. Dr. Amy Ruddock is VP Europe at Carbon Engineering. Prior to Carbon Engineering, Amy was VP Corporate Development and Sustainability at Virgin Atlantic where she was accountable for setting and delivering carbon strategy, securing expansion at London's Heathrow Airport, corporate strategy, and government affairs. So Young Oh is PhD student majoring in environmental policy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University, and a research analyst at Perspectives Climate Group in Germany with a focus on climate policy. And without further ado, I now turn it over to Dr. Sean D. Fitzgerald. Well, a very good morning to you. Um, what I wanted to first lay out is the challenge ahead, which is, you know, we're here at COP28 doing everything that we can to keep 1.5 alive. And what I wanted to first share with you is a fact that I find very challenging, very troubling. Um, it's a fact that is hiding in plain sight. So the IPCC AR6, which is the body of work compiled by hundreds of the world's most eminent climate scientists, have considered various scenarios going forwards for the, the temperatures that we are going to be experiencing. And the global average of 1.5, which we heard about and we keep talking about as being kept alive, is really what we should be keeping as our current target. And yet, 
There is not one scenario that the IPCC now considers in its evaluation and, its, and their education of us in terms of just where we might go that keeps us below one and a half degrees centigrade. The most ambitious and aggressive emissions reduction pathway with scaled up greenhouse gas removal, even that one, sees us sailing through one and a half degrees C centigrade mid-century before then dipping down by the end of the century to just below one and a half. And what does that mean? That means that we need to consider everything that we can in our toolbox in terms of emissions reduction and greenhouse gas removal and scaling them up as quickly as we can. So today, we're here to, to talk about greenhouse gas removal pathways and the way that I think about this is a spectrum of opportunities available to us, and they range from what we call nature-based solutions. So on the chart that we're looking at right now is in looking at the more nature-based solutions through to the more engineering types. And in all likelihood, there is a spectrum of an amalgam of the two, so hybrid solutions. And arguably, many of even the nature-based solutions could be defined as a hybrid because it's mankind inter intervening and supporting what would be a natural process and seeing whether, whether we can amplify that. But there is a lot to do, and that's what we're going to hear from the rest of the panel. Thanks, Sean. So ocean-based climate mitigation solutions are being explored as the ocean is the largest active carbon sink and already acts to moderate our climate by absorbing one quarter of our anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. The ocean, which covers 70% of the Earth, therefore offers the potential to scale these climate mitigation solutions. A range of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal approaches and deployment strategies are currently being explored. Some approaches focus on enhancing the biological cycles in the ocean, and this can include ocean fertilization, such as the addition of iron to surface waters to promote the growth of marine algae. Other approaches include um, biomass sinking, so this can involve the aquaculture of macroalgae or the sinking of terrestrial biomass such as wood chips. These approaches rely on the carbon-rich biomass penetrating to the interior and deep ocean to remain stored out of contact with the atmosphere on climate-relevant timescales, so usually several decades to hundreds of years. There are lots of open questions about, around these approaches and uh, they really require rigorous scientific assessment, such as what is the efficiency and repeatability of these strategies that promote biomass growth? Does this biomass growth lead to nutrient robbing downstream of deployment sites that could counteract the additional carbon storage? And how variable is the critical depth horizon where we can have confidence that this carbon will be stored on long time scales? And how does it vary across the ocean? Other approaches alter the chemistry of the surface waters, such as ocean alkalinity enhancement approaches, which increases the buffer capacity of the ocean and allows it to uptake and hold more carbon dioxide in ocean waters. So in contrast to the biological approaches, the efficiency of this method relies on these altered waters staying at the surface so that they can absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So for these approaches, uh, open questions include how quickly these deployed materials could dissolve before they settle out. How long will this um, perturb or this altered waters remain at the surface to allow this uptake of atmospheric carbon dioxide? And will there be any compensating effects that may reduce the uh, efficacy? Or are there any co-benefits such as the alleviation of ocean acidification? And for all these approaches, we have to ask, um, is it feasible to scale them up? So the oceanographic community is working to provide the underpinning scientific evidence needed to evaluate each, each approach to determine whether they're effective, feasible, safe, and scalable, to ensure that any deployments are undertaken responsibly and lead to verifiable carbon sequestration. By the end of this decade, the community is aiming to have proven or disproven ocean-based carbon dioxide removal technologies so that resources can be funneled to the most promising solutions. This will require the scientific consensus to be reached within a really short time frame. So there's lots of opportunities here to make strides towards progressing observational capabilities and the technological and model developments which are required to tune the research tools that we already have to be fit for purpose to evaluate these different carbon dioxide removal approaches and to monitor the effects of the deployments. This progress along with assessments of different approaches is also an opportunity for better understanding our ocean and what their sensitivity is to different stresses. So in summary, there's lots of work to do, and it's crucial that there is investment in underpinning scientific research in order to implement robust, cooperative monitoring, reporting, and verification of new and emerging ocean-based carbon dioxide removal strategies. 
and this is to ensure measurable progress towards net negative emissions while also protecting critical ocean ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Paul. Great. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Very um, honored to be a part of this, this discussion here today to really bring forward the opportunities for carbon removal in a variety of, of approaches as have been outlined and the importance of science and research to understand the, the challenges and address the, the key questions in making that possible. At the World Ocean Council, uh, we are the, the only global business and investment organization focused on ocean sustainable development and addressing climate and biodiversity and a range of other um, challenges that face the planet, uh, leading the way for business to, to provide and implement solutions. One of those key solutions is in carbon sequestration in the ocean. Uh, as Chelsea just mentioned, there's a variety of pathways uh, that uh, require, as she pointed out, more research to really understand how much carbon can be sequestered uh, is the amount of carbon uh, that is being held in, in through these various processes, is it staying sequestered for a long enough time in ways that don't affect uh, the ecosystems in the, uh, in the ocean that uh, are hosting that, that sequestration process. So we have now abundant research that really points out the potential. And these various pathways as as on the, on the screen right now are what are being uh, focused on for research, but also for business development. And the reason for that, as for the next slide, uh, is really the enormous potential here. The, the ocean is already the largest carbon sink and, and has been absorbing heat and, and carbon for many uh, centuries now uh, from the industrial era. Uh, the, the ocean does provide the only gigaton scale uh, nature-based solution for sequestering carbon. And the science uh, has begun to really show those numbers, as you can see here, uh, the different pathways for sequestering, uh, such as fertilization, uh, artificial upwelling and downwelling, seaweed cultivation and sinking, uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement, and electrochemical processes are able to, with these projections, to sequester gigaton scale levels of carbon. And the ocean covering 71% of the planet does provide the biggest, most uh, important opportunity we have in partnership with terrestrial opportunities that we'll hear more about today. As uh, per the, um, the, next, the next slide, uh, we would like to focus on engaging the business community then, uh, as is happening on the terrest in the terrestrial situation, but now more and more in the marine and ocean situation, to bring in the companies, the entrepreneurs, the enterprises that are developing carbon sequestration methodology and technology to enhance the natural processes, as, as Sean pointed out, to take advantage of the ocean's potential to sequester carbon. So to do that, we're bringing together the companies uh, that are focusing on this to help create a level of quality assurance, uh, standards of practice, uh, and really advance this potential in a collective way on a global scale, which is the scale at which these things need to happen. In addition to that work on the supply side, then really bringing in the demand side by organizing a buyer's coalition for ocean-based uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, and really connecting this in particular with the companies that are ocean related already, such as the shipping industry, offshore energy, and others, to really link the use of the ocean for commercial purposes to the use of the ocean for carbon sequestration as we all need to work together uh, and are moving to work together in uh, harnessing the role of the ocean and helping ensure we've got uh, a planet that can handle the climate change situation we have in front of us. And lastly, <clears throat> but very importantly, as Chelsea pointed out, we need to have the capacity to undertake the monitoring and verification and reporting, so MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification to ensure that carbon sequestration in the ocean is being undertaken in a way that's responsible, is addressing potential ecosystem impacts, and in fact is delivering the kinds of sequestration levels that uh, are being projected. Uh, so with that, we, we will continue that work, and, and this, the rest of this decade will be critical to getting the pilot projects underway, working with countries that have deep ocean spaces that are conducive to carbon sequestration, as well as working out the policy 
and uh, legal arrangements so that carbon sequestration in the ocean can proceed in the places where it is best possible to do so. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul and uh, Amy. At Carbon Engineering, we do direct air capture. What we're doing is we're using a series of large fans to draw um, carbon dioxide directly in from the atmosphere. And then we react to that carbon dioxide with uh, potassium hydroxide. It's a simple base. You've got acidic carbon dioxide. You've got basic potassium hydroxide. And people may remember from high school chemistry, acid plus basic equals salt plus water. That's the chemistry that we're using, very simple chemistry to draw uh, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Once we've captured it, we can then send it back into geology, back where it came from, creating a permanent removal. Or we can use that carbon dioxide to create closed circle products such as aviation fuel. But our focus for this panel is on that first case, the sending it back into the ge geology and the, um, the carbon removal. Our company, Carbon Engineering, was founded in, two, in 2009, and we first captured carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, at our pilot plants in 2015. We've had 14 years and billions of dollars of investment in our technology and learning, and today we're at commercial scale. So what you can see cycling on the screens is our first commercial scale plant out in Texas. It's in the Permian Basin. This plant is under construction. Um, the picture on the screen just then um, shows a couple of months ago and how far into construction we are. It's about 30% of the way through. We're expecting it to be operational in 2025. When it's op fully operational, it will be capturing 500,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere each year which scales up the global capacity today of direct air capture by about um, 100 times. Um, that plant is called Stratos. And then down the road in South Texas, we're working on a, on a second facility. We're in the engineering phase, and that will be capturing a million tons of carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere each year. And that plant there is supported by the US Department of Energy's Direct Air Capture Hubs program, which in total is a package of 1.2 billion to support this nascent technology. I look after Europe in the Middle East. Um, we have an MOU with ADNOC, uh, where we're looking at deploying this technology in, in Abu Dhabi at the moment. And we're currently in the feasibility engineering stages. I think whilst the technology matures and whilst we start to roll out these large-scale plants, what's going to be key is offtake. Who's going to pay? So today, the voluntary market is quite active. Um, looking back to that Stratos plant, some of our major offtakers are Airbus, who have procured 400,000 tons um, of removals, and Amazon, 250,000 tons, amongst others. I think for us, what's critical is that we move from a voluntary market to a compliance market to really scale up to the gigatons that are needed. Um, where do we look in compliance markets? I go back to my career in aviation. Aviation is a hard to abate sector. And if we look at international bodies on aviation, um, there's a consensus that at least 500 million tons of removals will be needed for, for this sector alone, on top of sustainable aviation fuels, on top of efficiency measures. So um, we look to those hard to abate sectors like aviation, like shipping, to start to create those compliance markets to scale up the technology to be available as it's needed. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And now, So Young. In our pursuit of accelerating carbon dioxide removal, we are facing opportunities and challenges presented by biomass for energy with CCS BEX and direct air capture and storage, as Amy mentioned. As we are moving forward with the global deployment of these technologies, we, are, we encounter hurdles in scaling up, and it is crucial to address them systematically. The first edition of State of CDR report released this year shows that the technology readiness levels of BEX and DAX are over five out of nine, meaning that these technologies are validated and demonstrated. However, we must understand that systems for BEX and DAX are not readily available yet um, due to complexities within value chains. A comprehensive understanding is crucial to unpack diverging implications of these two technologies and design effective policies. 
Vaccine ducts play crucial roles in GHG removal pathways, offering advantages of permanence as they question CO2 in geological formations, such as saline aquifers and minerals would be less vulnerable to external disturbances, such as the wildfires. Bags can replace natural picker plants, providing a competitive solution to balance intermittency issues if there are high carbon prices. But we cannot overlook its limitations, such as feedstock availability and land water requirements, as its CO2 removal efficiency can be significantly diminished by, any, by an initial carbon debt associated with land use changes. However, BACS is increasingly explored in other ways with various combinations to harness the full potential. Considerations for biomass type, energy use, and sector type are key variables which determine the implications and outcomes of BACS. For example, a greenfield power plant powered by energy use from dedicated monoculture plantations with CCS would have very different requirements compared to an existing waste incineration plant to be equipped with CCS capability. This shows that the devil lies in the detail and some types of bags have been overlooked, leaving important gaps in understanding details pertaining to policy design. Their air capture and storage, on the other hand, presents itself as a low-impact solution with minimal land and water requirements. But challenges exist in its intensive energy use and low economic viability, although each type of DAX technology has different requirements. Business models are highly dependent on either public or private support, carbon pricing-related incentives, and voluntary carbon markets. For both BACs and DAX, serious challenges may arise when quantifying the overall value chain. For example, countries with potential for BACs with insufficient storage capacities, cross-border export of CO2 for storage will be particularly challenging and require clarification through carbon accounting and international governance systems. To scale up BACs and DACs, technological solution providers like Carbon Engineering are central players, but government and private funding are equally important. Policymakers must systematically analyze potentials within energy systems and overall value chains. A balanced set of demand pool policies, such as carbon contract for differences and supply push policies, such as R&D investment, can in enable the initial deployment of BACs and DACs on a national scale. As we embark on this journey, we must ensure that the growth of CDR technologies is not reinforcing fossil fuels with CCS. Stringent carbon accounting, monitoring, reporting, and verification processes of carbon removal activities are significant when granting incentives to operators. Integrating BACs and DACs into the existing value chain is also critical for lowering the cost and ensuring visibility. In conclusion, in our pathway to achieving Paris Agreement goals with the GHG removals, it is paramount to have a comprehensive and nuanced understanding of the implications associated with biomass for energy with CCS and direct air capture and storage. Thank you. Thank you, Soyoung. And I'd like to turn it back to Sean. Perhaps there might be questions out there, or would you like to add anything? Well, before I add anything, are there any questions from the room? Uh, we do have one question um, over there, please. Thank you so much. I wasn't very attentive, but I was picking up on a few things that I really liked. But my question to one of you would be, anyone can take it up, is that the role of ocean is major. You proved it with your statistics, but how do you bring that knowledge to civil society organizations, especially the faith-based organizations? <laughs> because I come from a faith-based organization and I know a massive potential is there to uh, translate the knowledge into an action. So do you have any ways to bring your knowledge to the faith-based organizations and see if that potential could be tapped in? Thanks for the question. So a really important part of carbon sequestration in general, but particular, in particular the coastal and ocean carbon sequestration, especially the coastal, which is commonly known as blue carbon, so involving uh, mangrove and seagrass and salt marshes, et cetera, is engaging the coastal communities. Uh, and, and this is a part of a broader context of the social license to proceed with, with carbon sequestration in coastal and marine ecosystems and, and on land as well. Um, there is a, uh, certainly from the perspective of the companies that are getting involved, we are mobilizing for an outreach effort to really help inform communities of what 
carbon sequestration in coastal ecosystems, blue carbon, in other words, what it is, how it works, the pros and cons, what we know and what we don't know. There are pilot projects that have been underway in partnership with coastal communities for many years now for blue carbon. And so we also need to now replicate and expand that effort regarding ocean carbon sequestration that I was speaking about uh, so that coastal communities and particularly island nations uh, are familiar with and comfortable with what this is, the work that needs to be done, and have uh, the, the means and the opportunities to engage and, and voice their uh, interests and concerns and, and really become a part of a, a process that, and a partnership uh, and a community of practice on, on developing blue carbon and ocean carbon sequestration. So it's in a very, very important point. Uh, and, a, and being very much taken into consideration as this uh, business of carbon sequestration in coastal and ocean ecosystems moves forward. Uh, so um, what I wanted to sort of say, following the great insights from the panel this morning, is that there are different approaches to greenhouse gas removal, um, and they have different characteristics. And one of those characteristics is actually the basically uh, the technology readiness level that they already have and the rate at which they can be scaled. And we have to factor in all of these features when mapping out the future for greenhouse gas removals as we sort of navigate a pathway to one and a half degree centigrade, which is where we should be still striving for. So things like uh, the technology that carbon engineering have one of the great things is that it's available now and we can scale it. But as we've heard from the ocean-based uh, carbon dioxide removal opportunities, the scalability of that in terms of the ultimate potential, some of these other approaches look very attractive, but they have different challenges to do with, for example, uh, making sure that it's safe. So it's an environmental uh, issue. So not only is the carbon dioxide sequestered, is it also environmentally acceptable? So there are different characteristics that we need to further our knowledge base on at pace in order to do that. But I come back to the reason why we're here at COP28 is to do baking into the plans and as Amy laid out very clearly, we need to move away from it just being just a voluntary carbon market. We need to have something much harder than that and therefore actually having some compliance levels applied to this industry is something that we need to strive for and we all shout from the same hymn sheet saying this is what we need. So Charles, over to you. Thank you, Sean. And uh, I'd like to thank all our esteemed panelists for their valuable contributions here today. I'd also like to thank Sustainable Population Australia and the International Society for Ecological Economics who made this presentation possible. And on behalf of the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge University and the Climate Emergency Forum, I'd like to thank you all for attending this presentation and have a great day. Thank you.